Good afternoon. So today is one of those sessions where we have distinguished visitors um, at the end of my, my lecture. And uh, then we have start like a, a panel. Uh, and we have four visitors uh, today. And um, last time we tried the, the formula. And that was, I, I must say, a, a, great, a great success. It was a very lively uh, debate. I was even surprised to how lively it was. But um, I hope everybody was both informed and entertained by the way that um, these things uh, developed. As I said, um, before I start every talk, I, I make a kind of recap, a short recap of what I said uh, last time. Last time, we talked about um, fraud, infringement of, of rules. And um, we, we covered quite a, a wide range of, of things, going from proper fraud, which is breaching the law. And I gave the example of the Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme, but also going to, into um, some of the issues where it has been possible for firms, uh, financial firms, who had the intention to do something that would, would have been fraud, um, to have the laws changed in order that it wouldn't be fraud. And I gave two examples. And because they fall within uh, the range of what I'm going to say today, I, I will not go back to that, because I will say a word again uh, about, ab about the laws. Then we spent uh, quite, quite, quite some time on uh, different issues which is, are due to contradictions. Contradictions between a new law and the existing law. Uh, loopholes, as we say, meaning that there are maybe holes within existing uh, new laws, things that the legislature has not thought about uh, that would be possible to, I would I say, fi find some fault within the um, new, new text that would make it possible uh, to keep doing what one what wanted to do, what one wanted to do, uh, or even to develop new strategies, um, taking advantage of the fact that the legislature has not uh, find, uh, found the um, seen the contradiction beforehand. Uh, I talked also about a number of issues like moral hazard um, and um, conflict of, of, of interest, a, 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 t a number of uh, contradictions which are possible and uh, within the. Um, for instance, that often um, the, um, the logic of profit would, would lead one to do some things which may com come in conflict with the um, um, proclaimed, aimed that one would, uh, that one, one about the service one is providing, saying, OK, we're working essentially for our clients, but there are situations where working for the clients essentially will actually put you, yourself at, at a de detriment, and therefore you will not do. Um, I mentioned in, in some of early, earlier um, uh, lectures, um, one famous case of um, 2008, uh, when the, uh, the firm Goldman Sachs actually took advantage of the um, fact that their uh, clients trusted them in order to give them products uh, where, which were known to be um, of, poor, of poor quality. Today, we're going to talk as well during the, uh, the panel, is uh, during my lecture, about the, uh, the, the uh, relationship between the regulator and uh, financial institutions, which the regulator is uh, keeping in uh, uh, control and look, looking after. Um, in one of the, um, in one of the uh, texts that uh, uh, Professor Bellamans had uh, sent f to you for uh, you to, to look at um, in preparation of, of the lecture, I find a, a definition of a, a number of um, functions that the regulator uh, would be uh, fulfilling. And um, four points were, were, were mentioned. Gathering information to identify uh, potential risk. Being the regulator of systematic, excuse me, systemic risk, and systemic risk is a notion which has been introduced some time ago, but became very much came to the front very much during the current uh, crisis. Systemic risk is the risk of one particular incident leading to a chain reaction and taking after uh, after itself uh, the whole or important part of the financial system. Um, one, one, ex one major example from the recent crisis is the default of the um, investment bank Le uh, Lehman Brothers, which produced a few days later the um, a collapse of what is called the money markets. And some of you were yesterday at a, at a um, uh, discussion I had with Professor Bakla, Baklonova uh, about these, um, the, the, the money markets. Um, 
leading to a major crisis which led the uh, uh, governments of different countries to intervene and to um, put a, a lot of money, uh, hundreds of uh, billions of dollars, euros, yens into the system in order to prevent a further, a further collapse. Manage uh, bad um, assets. Uh, as you know, the regulator is in, in charge uh, of uh, making sure that there's, to prevent, uh, I would say, the, the first layer in possible bank runs. A, a bank run is something that happens with cli when clients, depositors in a bank, people have an account um, in, in, a, in a bank, uh, get scared that maybe the bank doesn't, doesn't have any enough resources to refund uh, every one of their clients uh, in case of a uh, insolvency that they will not have the resources uh, to pay all the clients for the money that was deposited on, on their accounts. I had the um, opportunity in the United States to work. I wasn't working with that company at the time that the bank run took, took place, but I had worked um, shortly be before, <coughs> excuse me, in DMAC, in, in um, a, a, um, and a financial institution specialized in loans, in um, house loans, home loans, uh, for what is what's called Alt-A, which sometimes has been confused currently with a subprime. It was different. It was essentially what's been called liar loans um, because there was very little control on the information that the uh, borrower would give about himself or herself uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, resources. At some point um, in 2008, uh, customers lost confidence in the ca ca capability of IndyMac to, um, to um, pay back the, um, the amounts which were um, deposited on, on the accounts. And on a, on a Thursday, people crowded in, in the street. The following day, there were more people. The police was there to cordon the area. And uh, on the uh, Monday morning, the bank was reopened, and um, instead of having on the on, on the front IndyMac Bank, there was a banner between the two saying IndyMac Federal Bank. It had been seized by the FDIC. Uh, it had been seized by the American government and had become a, a provisionally a. Um, a federal bank. I mean, in, there was it was the government of the United States was one in charge of the of the company and um, was trying to solve the issues which had uh, had, had arisen. Personally, I, I discovered the uh, I discovered the relationship between banks and regulators in the practice of being an employee of a of, of a bank. Um, the fir the first. Uh, the first opportunity, and I smile when I, when I say it, because that was quite a, a shock for me to discover this in that particular context. Um, at that time, I was working in, in, in Holland. I was working for a company based in, uh, in, in London, but we were doing uh, consultancy jobs uh, all over uh, Europe. And what we were doing was the following. It was a time where, that a, um, there was much attention given to a, 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 a risk management tool called value at risk. Value at risk essentially, essentially takes the portfolio of, the, of a whole uh, financial establishment and looks at what risk is being taken uh, on a daily basis or weekly basis uh, in terms of what kind of risk is, can, 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 be, can, can be taken. It's a type of information about how risky the positions of a financial uh, institution are at a particular time. Um, I had the opportunity last week in, in Paris to discuss about a, a major, uh, the, the, um, the seminar there was about financial models and all the misunderstandings ar around these models. In the case of that value at risk, the major um, misunderstanding is that the value which comes out of the system as being value at risk is considered by the profession, or usually by people in finance, as being a maximum amount that can be risk in a particular circumstances. Actually, the model is, is set in such a way that uh, what is the figure that comes out is a minimum amount of uh, risk that's being taken in these circumstances, which makes, makes a, a, a real difference. If you look at it in the perspective that if things go wrong, 
at a maximum you would lose, let's say, $5 million uh, on, a particular, uh, on a particular day. It's a very different issue than thinking that on a particular day you may, you, you may lose at least $5 million because it, gives, it doesn't give you any information about what the maximum value is. And the maximum value in that case may very well something that puts your uh, financial institution into, uh, into insolvency. So it could lead to its, uh, uh, to its end, in fact. And so I'm just saying that because that's what I was doing at, at, at the time. And we were installing that, um, a, a new software that was calculating that value, value at risk. And my, my, my particular function in that was to uh, assess the validity of the, of the software that we, were, um, that we were putting in the, um, in, in the new system of that, of that bank because that bank had to produce these figures. These, these figures would be shown to the regulator, and the regulator would approve um, the, uh, the procedure and make sure that the amounts that were uh, mentioned, that were, how would I say, the figures that would be spit out by, by, the, by the software, uh, would be satisfactory. What I would do was essentially to do the whole process by hand and see if the figures produced by the um, software would be would be the same. That's the way you you do. Um, I, find, I had found some some major errors. Uh, it, it was a uh, risk management system, so you could say that possibly it was not that important, and there was a, a small small error in the calculations. But it turned out very rapidly that the errors were not in the module we were producing for the value at risk, but um, things that were upstream. It was, it was actually the existing system before that module that was producing a, a mistaken figures. And that was much more serious because these, these figures were, not, in that case, not used at all for risk management but they were used to charge clients. So uh, small errors would be something that would not be actually to tolerable uh, at all. And so what happened is that I had stopped, I had told people that we couldn't go on before we, I had found out exactly what, what the errors were, were because the figures were, uh, there was some, I would say, essential risk for the, for the bank itself having uh, the wrong figures being uh, produced. And then, as I said, not only in terms of risk management, but also simply for the running of the day-to-day -day, uh, um, life of that, of that bank. And it happened that during those days where the process was, was stopped, there was a cocktail party at, at the bank on one of these beautiful, on the Rembrandtsplein in Amsterdam, if you're familiar with that, uh, in one of these uh, uh, um, beautiful hotels. And I, I am there standing with my, my glass, and there's somebody com coming to me. Um, and that gentleman, who was about at the time the age I'm, I'm, I'm now, he says, you know who I am. He speaks to me. And, and I said, no, I, I don't know who you are. He said, I know who you are. And I say, right, OK. And then he tells me his name. And I recognize his name because he's number two or number three in, the, in, that, in that bank, which is a major, major bank. Um, and I say, he says, I know who you are. You are the man who's stopping the, the whole process. And I said, yes, because, yeah, I'm, I'm, if, you're familiar, if you know what, what I'm, I'm doing, yes, indeed, because we need to show the regulator figures which are correct. And he looks at me, and he's, 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 he's really mad at me. He's really angry. And he says, you, there's something you don't understand. That's not the way th things work. And I say, mm, uh, I don't have anything to, to say in reply. He says, no, because I'm, I'm going to tell you, young man, that's not the way it works. I'm going to show the figures to the regulator, and that will be it. And it goes away. And um, what he was making me understand is that it's not the regulator who was, or would uh, uh, check the figures. He would tell what the figures were, and he was expecting that the regulator had nothing else to uh, say in, in addition. Um, I don't know how representative that is, but that was my first encounter with uh, on, 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 about a clash between the regulator and the uh, institutions they were um, they are supposed to to, to regulate. My, my second experience was at the time I was working in American banks and. Um, we would, we would receive, and what is relevant, I have to say first, is that uh, American financial institutions have kind of a choice of their regulator. They can change their status um, in order to be, um, th th there's an, a number um, uh, of, of, of reg regulators. I don't necessarily <coughs> remember all the uh, different acronyms. Um, but you can change, if, if, you, if you as a bank are 
unhappy with your regulator, you may actually change regulator by changing the status of, of, of your bank, which is a way out of difficulties you may, you may encounter. But then the regulator would come, there would be uh, investigations, and they would write a letter to you, you the bank, and tell you um, this needs to be uh, fixed, this needs to be changed, uh, we investigated this and this, and, uh, and uh, we expect that you will make changes accordingly. And there my experience was, was, was different. Um, somebody would be found, like a person like me, and told, okay, write something back. And you would write something back, and then what you would write back would be kind of examined very briefly in a meeting, and people say, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But the implication would be the following. The issue was only to write a letter that would satisfy the, um, the regulator, but there was no suggestion at all that what you were writing in that letter would be anything that would be implemented in, 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 in any possible way. There was no, uh, would I say, no follow-up in terms of uh, complying with what you had said had been fixed or that you were about to do um, in order to, to change things. So there was in that, it was another instance of showing that there was, how would I say, a largely the instructions were largely ignored uh, c coming from the from the re regulator. I, I um, in, in one of the texts that uh, Professor Bellman says uh, has uh, proposed there as part of that the document you, you've seen, I, I've seen a number of authors saying that um, the issue of the. Um, that maybe we have a too negative view about the, the relationship between uh, regulator and, uh, and regulated um, because there are different, different views, can be held by different regulators. There might be different point of view, uh, point of views. There might be different ways of um, defending, how would I say, defending any public interest uh, in terms of the working of the um, of, the, uh, of these in financial institutions. There might also be conflicting uh, requests from them that they would do something which makes sense, but they would do something else also, which makes sense also, but would produce some kind of contradiction be between the, the two. Um, as I say, my, 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 my ex professional experience has, has been somewhat, uh, <clears throat> what I say, uh, suggests that the issues might be m much more serious than, than that, that it's not only a problem of, of, of perspective. Uh, what was the case in most of the time I, I was working, and particularly in the United States, was that there were instructions coming from, from high up uh, in terms of, um, how would I say, not interfere with, uh, with auto self-regulation uh, in, in the markets with this, Actually, I mean, this, this ties, ties in with, with things we've said before, that uh, there, there was, since the 1960s and 1970s, a, a very dominant view, at least in, in, within uh, economic theory, that the, the least you would interfere, the best it would be for, for the industry. And um, when, when the crisis um, started, and that you know, one of the, the titles you would see in the newspaper was the regulator was asleep at, at the wheel. Uh, it was not necessarily out of, out of uh, how would I say, distraction or absent-mindedness. It may have been also because there was a climate um, suggesting that this would be essentially what a regulator would, would, would do uh, to keep an eye, a benevolent eye on, on things and would not really in, intervene. The, the best example is one I mentioned on, uh, some, some other time, is that when Mr. Greenspan, who was the, st still then uh, that in that period, because he was, he was the head of the federal governor of the Federal Reserve from 1987 to 2006, when he was approached by um, by Governor uh, Gramlich, governor of a, one of the uh, um, regional um, federal banks, when he was approached and, and was told about the, uh, the looming uh, disaster in the uh, subprime industry, uh, he told him that, uh, that the industry knew best and that there was no reason to, to interfere. Previously, when he was asked by um, Mrs. Bourne, uh, when Greenspan was asked by Mrs. Bourne to start uh, uh, 
producing directives about how to regulate the uh, derivative uh, financial instruments. He said there was no need to, uh, to do that. That was very much, I mean, he was the most in that period, these nearly 20 years, 1987, 20, 2006, he was the dominant figure, uh, not only in, in the United States, but by being the head of the Federal Reserve in the United States, he was the most important person in, on the financial markets and internationally. But that was a climate that he was, uh, um, that he was, um, supporting as, as being the way of, of, of doing the, 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 the business. When the, when the crisis, of course, um, developed, then we saw that, well, it turned out that it was not enough, not, not enough what, what was done. And what, what I will do now, I will review a number of, uh, of cases because they're, they're quite, um, quite revealing and they tell us a, a lot about um, what are the issues through the illustration, what are the issues that we encounter on that on this particular uh, subject? <clears throat> the, the first I will mention it's an, an I said an, it's an events that took place in in two thousand and and nine. Um, the, the first the first incident is in in, in um, March. I think it's on the twentieth of March, um, two thousand and nine. And then the the the, um, the consequences the the outcome is um, on, on the 2nd of April, uh, a, few, a few, like, like three, three, weeks, three weeks later. Um, there's one uh, institution, it, maybe it shouldn't be called it's, it's exactly a regulator, um, but it is, it, is a, um, it is a board. It's called the um, FASB, which is the Financial Accounting Standards Board. It is, it, it is a board that decides in a dialogue with the industry about how, what, how to change and how to set uh, the accounting rules, which will be used in for um, a company uh, to uh, declare their um, uh, quarterly um, balance. The, uh, in, in, 2000, in, in 2006, there had been a, a, ch a change in, in, in the rules. And I, I won't go in, into the details because that would lead us not a bit far away from, from ethics and, and finance. It would lead, lead us too much into the technicalities. But there are different ways to, um, to value um, financial assets. You can, let, you, let me give a very simple example. Uh, you can value something at the price, at the price you, you bought it. I can say this is wor worth uh, one euro and, and, and 20 cents because that's what I've, I've been uh, paying for it. But you, but you will say, no, it's open. I mean, you can't resell it for that particular price and you've, you've, you've already sipped some of it. So you can not, definitely not resell, regard it as being still worth your uh, 120. This is typically the kind of problems we have when we, when we, when we buy something. And um, there are different, I mean, just, as I say, I won't go into the details, but let's say if, if you have some, some, some product in, in a part of your portfolio of, of your, 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 your bank, you, you can make a, a major difference between, is it something that if you were asked if you can buy it tomorrow or today, uh, you would say yes, or is it something you want to keep for, for a, a long time? If it's something, let's say, let's, if, let's say it's an obligation, it's a debt instrument uh, that uh, you bought at the time it was issued and it's a 10-year instrument. You may say, I have no intention of selling it before the end of the 10 years, so I'm going to calculate what it's worth in terms of, in terms of what I paid for it, and in terms of what, for instance, uh, you, you will say, I'll, I'll be paid interest over the 10 years, and what this, this interest is worth now, I will calculate by discounting it. I mean, there are methods for, for, for doing that. But if it's something that you say, I'm, you're, I'm prepared to sell it any time, any time now, and, that, and there are wide variations in the price for that asset uh, on the market, in particular, which is a case in particular in in, uh, in times of crisis, when the um, people may switch their uh, their views about being prepared to buy it or, or not uh, very quickly, then you would have to value that product that you're prepared to to sell. Yeah, you will have to um, um, to uh, value it as what's, what's called mark to market. You will mark it in your book to the price which the market is prepared to pay uh, at, at, at on, on on the spot right now. And that may make a great, great difference. When the, um, when, when the subprime crisis developed, 
there were doubts whether the subprime borrowers would be able to pay back the, um, the money they, they had um, borrowed. But if you said, okay, well, I bought, I bought that uh, security, and it's a 20-year security, so I don't care. I put, that, I, I, I put it in the portfolio in the bank, and I put it in a box, and I will reopen that box in 20 years' time, and we'll see what, 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 what will happen. Uh, that, that's one particular approach because the price was actually com, com, coming, coming down very quickly. And actually, the Chinese who had bought a, a lot of these products, that's what they said. They said, we won't bother to, to see how much, for how much it will sell uh, back on the market uh, tomorrow. We don't care about that. These are maturity of that product is 20 years. Uh, we put it in the box, and in 20 years' time, we'll, we, we'll, we'll, we'll look again. They couldn't do that. They said that in the beginning. They didn't do it because they were, they were actually engulfed in the same, uh, the same doubts as, as, as the other. But let's say you're a client of a bank that says, says that, um, what will you do? You will say, well, these people, well, let's trust them that, you know, that they won't open the box for, for 20 years. Or you will say, well, they have these very devalued uh, products, toxic bonds, as what they, they were called later on. And I don't care what they say about it, that they would keep them for the 20 years. I think that thing has not any value left. And I think the whole bank is insolvent right now because they don't have any, enough money to, to pay. So what had happened in 2007, at six, excuse me, um, was the FASB. The FASB had moved into going in, uh, in suggesting that everything had on, uh, more or less to be uh, accounted for at the market value at, at the time. And that is wonderful if you were in, uh, I would say, in a period of economic plenty, when prices don't move much, everybody trusts every, everybody else. And, in that case, the market variation may be really very small, and there wouldn't be any major difference um, from one quarterly account of your balance uh, uh, to, to, to the next. But we, when you enter a crisis period and people lose faith in the value of these, these projects, uh, in the, of these uh, products, things change dr dramatically. And what happened is that we are now at the beginning of 2009. We are in March 2009. And um, the, the collapse of, um, of the money markets took place in the second half of September, a few months before. And if you were marking things to market in that early period of 2009, a lot of banks would be in real trouble because you, of the volatility and the low value of uh, quite a large number of their, their products. And the heads of the FASB are being summoned to come to a commission uh, from the American Congress. Um, I, haven't, I haven't written that, down the name of that particular uh, uh, committee. Uh, the thing which is amusing to know is that the, um, uh, Mr. Beuter, who was a, at the time, who was a famous columnist of the uh, Financial Times, and is now a major figure within, within Citigroup, uh, had called that particular committee from the Congress, he called that a, a subsidiary, he, call, he called it, of the American Bankers Association, uh, suggesting that uh, they were close relationship between that committee and the industry itself. And the fact is that on the following day, the day after the meeting I'm going to tell you about, um, the Wall Street Journal uh, wrote a list of the members of that com um, committee who are just parliamentarians. Um, they're not supposed to be part of the banking system. Uh, the Wall Street Journal made produce their list and how much they had received these individual people um, from the industry, from the financial industry, in the years, uh, in the years be before, um, there were interviews uh, later on uh, to these different Congress people, whether the amounts they were to receive had any influence on that decision, and um, and they said no. There was a unanimity among them to say that it had no impact. But what happened? So these people from the FASB were summoned, and they were told to change the rules. And these people say, well, that's not the way it happens. I mean, this is an initial. We have an ongoing process of discussion, the dialogue with the industry. Uh, we review rules. We produce new rules. But we're not taking orders like that. And there are the videos. It's, it, it, it turned into a fight. It became a, a shouting fight. Uh, there were actually uh, cries within the room. And the people from the FASB were told 
were told by these enraged um, Congress people to ch that they had to change the, the rules. Um, some of their uh, leaders uh, resigned, resigned rather than, 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 than complying. Uh, but on the 2nd of April, they had come with, with a, a new, new uh, new rules. The FASB had come up with new rules. They changed the uh, FASB uh, rule 157. Uh, they changed the content. They, they, ch they made it much more conservative. It was much easier from then on to regard a product as being not marked to market, but marked to model. Uh, Mr. Warren Buffett called that marked to model. He called that marked to myth. M-Y-T-H, so meaning that when you mark to model, you can actually make up the story that you wish, as long as you have some justification for, for how to, to do that. Marking to model is, as I said, and a bit like the calculation I just said, okay, well, this I bought it for so much, there's a sip less, it's open, et cetera. Uh, you can make um, uh, some calculation. And, you have leeway, you have a, a large amount of freedom to decide how your model will be, um, will, be, will, will be set. But it was clear that that made it possible for a number of fir firms who, had they made the mark-to-market um, calculations, would have been in a very difficult uh, position indeed. There was a jump on the 2nd of April when the rules were changed. There was a jump by 5% up on the American markets. Um, what, what is amusing, and that's a little anecdote, is that um, on my blog, I explained that because we, I mean, on my blog, that and they, I had followed up the, the, the events. I told, told about the different meetings. I, I, I told people that the, uh, that, um, the rules would uh, be instated on, on 2nd of April, and so there was no surprise in, in the um, American uh, and, and British press, financial press, about why, what was the reason for the, um, um, for the prices going up by 5%. Suddenly, a number of, of, uh, of firms who were in the red, who were insolvent with the former formulation of the rules, were suddenly uh, solvent again because they had marked to model uh, a number of their assets. There was some incident, I don't remember which one it was, in France, which led the French financial uh, press to say that the explanation was that minor incident which had happened in French and French politics, showing the, uh, how would I say, the gap between uh, people who read English and people who don't because they, um, they lose a lot of, uh, I mean, the French press that doesn't read English lo loses a lot of the information about what's going on in, in, in the world. So this is an interesting um, a case where there was, where the, I would say, the power balance between the regulator, if you wish, in the industry was clearly um, visible. There had been even, let's say, there was no physical contact between the people, but there was some shouting that can see, be seen on the videos of, the, uh, um, of that meeting of the, of the committee. And the committee complied, apart from the few people, I think there were two uh, at the FASB who decided to resign rather than to comply in that kind of, a, in that kind of, of, of climate. Another incident which is interesting also about a, regular, about a relationship is uh, something which came up uh, recently, just before the, the, the summer, actually. Um, it's, the, uh, the, it's called the LIBOR affair. Um, the LIBOR affair took place actually in 2008, but for some reason people were too busy in 2008 to pay m much attention to that. Uh, and it's only when fines were imposed on, um, on the banks for the way they had behaved during that crisis uh, that the incident, uh, incident came to the surface. Uh, the paradox is that it, it is the bank which was probably the least um, culprit in the, uh, in the case that by volunteering for, you know, making the, 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 how would I say, settle the whole issue, uh, the Barclays, Barclays Bank in, in, in Britain, uh, who was at the center of the, um, of the whole affair, which led to a number of resignation and, and, and so on. I, I, will, I will summarize that, that issue because it's, it's very interesting also in terms of these uh, relationships. Um, the, the, the LIBOR, LIBOR is a, uh, is a set of rates, and these rates apply to, um, are called interbank rates. It is the rates that um, banks charge each other for lending to each, each other. 
um, the LIBOR is in, uh, libeled, labeled in, in dollars, and it is a, um, a euro dollar. Euro dollar means the following. Uh, as, as you may know, in 1944, um, there was an agreement at, um, at Bretton Woods at the end of the, the war, and where it was decided that the dollar would, only, would not only be the, um, the uh, American currency, which is valid on the, on the, um, on the, within the, the territory of the United States, it will also be valid as a uh, international um, currency, as a um, reserve currency as a, a, or a reference cu currency, uh, which are the phrases which are being used. So there, there would be dollars being used within the United States, <clears throat> but there would also be dollars which would be used outside of the um, United States. And the reason it's called Euro do dollar is, is the following, is it because it, it dates, the, 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 the label dates from the time when Russia um, had decided to uh, issue a um, an obligation labeled not in ruble, but to, to um, uh, labeled in, in, in dollars. And the way that, that these rates, which are market rate, meaning, meaning that they're not fixed, they fluctuate. Uh, banks don't lend uh, to each other uh, on the same, in, on, for the same price, if you wish. That rate being a price that you pay for um, borrowing um, is set by now what I say, it's set by, by fluctuations within, with, within the market. And the way they, you report it, <coughs> excuse me, in the press is the following. Uh, you ask 16 banks, how much have you been charged for borrowing by your, all your colleagues, by the other banks? Look, look at any transaction that they before and tell us before 11 o'clock in the morning how much you were charged for borrowing from, from other banks for three months, for one month, for a year, and, 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 and so on. It doesn't go very high up. Uh, LIBOR is usually referred to as being three months, or one month, three months, or, or, or six months. And so the figures are put together by the um, uh, British um, Bank Association. Um, I'm not too sure I remember exactly what is the British Bank Association. Anyway, they, 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 get the, they collect the information. Uh, the, Reuters, the Reuters press agency uh, um, calculates the, the rates in the following manner. They take the 16 rates which have been uh, quoted for, by 16 different banks for, let's say, three months and borrowing for three months, and you rank them, the highest to the lowest. What you do, you eliminate, you ignore the four lowest, and you eliminate the four highest. You look at the eight in the middle, and you make an average, an arithmetical mean. You add the values, and you divide by, by, by eight. And that will be the regarded as the following day in the papers as being the value for LIBOR. And that LIBOR is not only used uh, between banks, it's also a reference which is used, for instance, when you set uh, the uh, rate for some uh, mortgages from some uh, home credits in the United States, you use that uh, as reference too. Why? Because most of these securities actually circulate in the rest of the world rather than being uh, staying within the American territory. Also because there are more, how would I say, there are more maturities for uh, euro dollars than they are for necessarily for the um, treasuries in the United States for the um, obligations, that instrument that circulate uh, within the, uh, within the uh, United States. And what, what, happened, <coughs> what happened in, the, um, in, in 2009 is there was a suspicion suddenly that these figures that were quoted were not accurate that banks were not mentioning the actual, um, the actual rates that they were charged by, by others. Why? You see, so the process, the process um, relied heavily on trust. Banks are asked, how much do other people charge you? Is there any conflict of interest suggesting that these banks may not quote the right figure, that they would produce another figure than the actual one. Well, yes, yes, and in a major way, and I mean, particularly not only in a major way, but even more so during a time of crisis. When, when the bank lends to another, they usually charge what they would be charged in order to borrow. But they would also, according to, to whom you, you're lending, you will add uh, 
pre a risk premium, you will charge more to somebody who's less likely to give you the, the money back. This is called a risk a risk premium. The less, the least people trust you, the more they will ask you a higher rate for lending to you. It's the same as you go to the bank. Uh, if you have a poor record, um, you, will, you will be charged more or higher interest than if you have a very good record. If you have a lot of money, uh, if you can make an important um, uh, down payment, uh, you will pay less. This is the way it, it works. It's justifiable. The un, un, un underlying process uh, principle is simply that if you lose money sometimes by lending to somebody, you will not repay. Well, you can statistically, I would I say, recoup that by asking a little bit more to the one who's likely that he will pay, he would not be able to, to re reimburse. In a situation of crisis, by revealing that a bank, by revealing that other people charge them a lot of money, they expose themselves, they show that people don't trust them anymore. We also we are also in a climate where people can ensure themselves against the risk of you not paying back not necessarily by going to an insurance company, but by using an instrument I already mentioned in other lectures, which is a credit default swap. You can actually protect yourself against the uh, against a loss uh, in uh, that in instrument. But a credit default swap, until recently in Europe, is something you can also use as a speculative tool. You can also use it in order to make a bet on something going wrong somewhere. And you can also, by doing it, and doing it skillfully, you can also add the pressure yourself. You can make it more difficult for the company which is in difficulty, or for the state, the nation which is in difficulty, you can make it more difficult to it. By betting, it will, it will uh, go, go down. So in a situation like <clears throat> the beginning of 2000, and, um, no, in, in 2008, actually, uh, the, 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 the scandal, the LIBOR scandal developed in 2008. 2008, you're right in the middle of, of, of the crisis. It is dangerous for a bank to reveal that, um, that you're in trouble because the other ones may bet against you and, and put you down. That happened, it's been seen in the United States. When a bear turns, investment bank goes down in March uh, 2008. The other investment banks have been betting uh, uh, on its downfall. It's the same when Lehman Brothers goes down. Uh, it, 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 is, it, it, it does, does happen. In 2008, there's a general interest for all the banks who give these quotes to say that, that, that everybody around trusts them and to give a figure which is lower than the one that um, is actually quoted. That, they, that is actually quoted to them when, when, when they, they borrow. And what happens is, is the, the following. It turns out that there have been also calls from high up to tell the banks to do so. Um, this this um, spring, when the incident from 2008 comes to the surface in terms that finally a fine is being imposed of some of the banks for having cheated on the figures they were quoting. Uh, Barclays Bank is the first to volunteer uh, to go through that. I think they, um, they have to pay a fine. If I remember the figure exactly, it's 359 uh, million euros they have to pay. It's translated from, from uh, British, British pounds. It's a large amount of, of, of money. Um, they are, they are uh, being um, fined for having lowered the figures um, that uh, they, were, they were quoting compared to what they were actually uh, charged by, by others. The, 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 the head of the company, uh, CEO, is uh, Bob Diamond. He is a call to, a, um, call to, a, um, to talk to a uh, commission, uh, a committee uh, in the, of regulators in, um, in, in London. And he justifies himself by saying that he had a, um, he had a conversation with Paul Tucker, who was vice, vice governor of the um, Bank of England at the time, and that Paul Tucker uh, had advised him to give uh, uh, figures which were lower than uh, the actual ones. And Paul Tucker would have said in that conversation that he was actually getting um, instructions from higher up, meaning from the government, uh, ministers or prime minister, to uh, do so. 
there's a, there's number three in Barclays was also asked to testify, and he was asked, what, how did you react when you were told, if, if it were true, how, did you, how would you have reacted uh, when you were told by the, um, um, by the um, uh, regulator to lower the figures from what they actually were, and that the regulator would tell you that the, uh, the orders would uh, have come up from higher up. Mr. Bob Diamond had tried to, uh, how would I say, defend himself through, how would I say, wriggling himself out in the uh, different arguments, but that Monsieur Del Messier, um, he replied the following. He said that was the only thing to do. And he was asked, you were not surprised that you were told to do so? He said, no, that was the only way to save the industry. And why? Because if, if the actual rates had been reflected, it would have made the situation of the financial establishment much more difficult. It would have revealed that, everybody, that nobody was trusting anybody else. The rates would have been higher up. There were difficulties. The, the rates, as I told you, are a benchmark for a number of, of things. His reply was, it was justified for the person at the Bank of England who told me to, to, to lie on the figures, and it was justified for the ministers who had told him to do so, uh, to, um, for them to do that also. It didn't make any difference because Barclays it was, was, who turns out to have been one of the least cheaters because we have the figures from that time, uh, they, they resisted more to pressure than a lot of their, of their colleagues. But they were still fine now. It is a paradox because if you think of this idea of, <coughs> of the invisible hand of, uh, of Adam Smith, of trying, uh, of self-regulation uh, going in, on in, in the markets, this was, would have been an, a, 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 a really beautiful example. The industry reacted to a situation of crisis by circulating information that was minimizing the crisis. It's called a, a negative feedback. Negative doesn't mean that it's a, it has a, uh, dangerous consequences, quite the reverse. A negative uh, f f feedback is a, f a feedback that absorbs the shocks, makes things less, less, um, less Less dangerous than, than they were. A positive feedback is the reverse. It's a chain reaction. It's a snowballing effect. Um, in this case, the paradox is that everybody having behaved, I would say, in the way to save the system, but breaking the rules, it turns out now that people are being, uh, are being, how would I say, uh, penalized for that. It ended up that the three top people in, uh, at Barclays had to resign. Mr. Mr. Bob Diamond, uh, his, uh, the, 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 the president, I, I forget his name right, right now, and that Mr. Del Messier, uh, who was, a, as far as I remember, chief operating uh, officer. Uh, Mr. Mr. Paul Tucker, uh, vice governor of the Bank of, of England, uh, was asked also to testify. He testified he was, I would say, his performance was, was pathetic. He, he's not at all a good liar, which is also a compliment, probably, but he probably, he was regarded as, his, as the, the, the likely successor of, of uh, Mervyn King at the, uh, at the head of the, um, of the Bank of England. And uh, my feeling is that he lost, his, uh, he lost all his chances uh, during that, that particular uh, meeting. A, th a third example, and I'm checking my, my watch because I know we have a bit less time today than the other day. It's, an, it's another um, interesting case. Here is the, uh, I would say, the, the impact of lobbying and, and money is, is the most relevant aspect of, the, of that affair. Um, in 1999, one of the American states, the state of, of North, North Carolina, um, passed uh, some, some new rules which forbid most of the practices that were associated to what be, would become uh, subprime loans. Um, all loans had to be amortizing. Uh, you couldn't have loans where you would pay less as a monthly payment than at least the interest. Um, these, um, these loans are called uh, negative amortization loans, where you can pay less than the interest you own even on a month, and that the, the, the money that you don't pay you don't pay enough accrues on the loan amount. The loan amount goes up because you haven't even paid the interest on your monthly uh, payment. A number of practices in terms of, of sales um, were forbidden by the state of uh, North Carolina. 
The Mortgage Bankers Association, um, which is the uh, professional union, uh, the uh, syndicate of the, uh, of the um, bankers who are uh, lending money for um, home loans uh, called mortgages, they decided to act against against uh, that that law. Um, they, they 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 set the case that um, by by pr forbidding these practices, uh, it amounted to uh, racial discrimination in the uh, United States. Uh, you know that um, the population of the United States is very much layered in terms of ethnic group. When you look at um, uh, patrimony, at wealth, um, typically I'll, I'll just give one example. Um, Asians in the United States are the ethnic part of the country which makes most money uh, in in the United States. The white people come down, and, and when you um, when you look down, you have Hispanics. Hispanics are often people coming from Mexico, Guatemala, Central America, and you have people of um, African descent in the United States. If you if you indeed prevent um, certain amount of cheating in, in practices, you can uh, actually indeed impact ethnic groups in diff different ways because they are layer layered in terms of, of, of wealth. Um, so the Mortgage Bank Association started first by, by, by financing studies that would uh, have for um, aim for goal to show that uh, forbidding these practices, it would amount to, uh, to racial discrimination. Uh, I read one of the reports produced by, by a cabinet uh, study, uh, study group uh, was, uh, I would have said, did an excellent job. They were paid by the Mortgage Association, but they showed there was no evidence that there was uh, amounted to racial discrimination. Quite the contrary, because, because of the preven preventing, preventing uh, some practices being um, taking place would actually shift the industry towards the uh, federal banks rather than uh, some more local banks which were uh, at uh, less assets and would be more uh, shaky in terms of their uh, in terms of, of their, their assets and their um, sol solvency um, the Mortgage Bank Bankers Association managed to, on, in the end, added up to $500 million in, in lobbying to prevent other states uh, to adopt, the, um, adopt that, that, that um, a similar, uh, similar um, um, law. Um, in my view, if, 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 um, if, if a majority of the states in the United States um, would have passed that law, the uh, subprime crisis would not have uh, taken, taken place. I, w I was working in the subprime industry at, at, at the time, so we were keeping really an eye on what was going there. Um, what is amusing is that after, the, after 2008, uh, the Canadian government um, was extremely pleased that there was, there was no subprime crisis in, the, in, in, in Canada. And uh, in kind of self-congratulating reports, they said because the, uh, the, the Canadian bankers are so much smarter, they had more vision and so on. But the fact is simply that Canada had from the beginning a law which was very similar to that of North Carolina for the whole country, and that prevented um, anything of that type uh, developing. So. Um, in this case, this is an interesting case where simply, I would say simply the, the, the amount of money uh, set into the process managed to prevent a, uh, what would have been, a, I would say, a very uh, positive legislative process, which had, I mean, we were still paying uh, to, to a large extent the consequence of that subcrime crisis. If, it, if, if, if anything it could, could have been done uh, to prevent it, it would have been a, a, a great thing. When I'm in discussions where, where with, with colleagues where people say, well, it, it's impossible to find anybody who's responsible for the subcrime crisis, I say, well, I mean, I can give you the six or seven names of the people who are at the head of the Mortgage Bankers Association, and these people are very much responsible for the decisions they, they made. And in particular, to, um, to find that these $500 million that uh, uh, allowed the subprime crisis to, to, to develop. To develop and another interesting case is the case of what happened recently in the um, uh, with what is called high frequency trading. Um, 
from the from the very beginning, when you have a stock exchange, and even even when 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 there were uh, simply human beings doing the process, you know, with a bid and an ask, uh, a bid is when you make an offer for a price. You say, I'm, I'm prepared to um, to buy uh, th this amount of that particular share or stock uh, for that particular price. And some other people are there saying, well, I'm prepared to sell. And that's an, uh, an, an, ask, an asking price. Uh, for, I'm, I'm surprised to send, sell so many uh, for that particular price. And typically, the, the price that's being asked is, um, is higher than the price at which is being bid, which is being offered. And it's only when the two meet, of course, that the transaction takes place, when there's an agreement to sell and buy the same amount of shares. From the beginning, there was a, um, I would say, there was a premium ongoing as fast as possible. But human beings are, are quite limited. And in particular, when you, um, when you wanted to annul, when you wanted to uh, avoid a particular transaction that had taken place, you had to take a person called a, a runner. And a runner would be a pers person that would indeed run from the desk which had uh, purchased something to the, um, uh, to the, um, to, to the desk which had um, sold something or in the other direction and say, well, there was a, there was a misunderstanding. We would like to annul that particular uh, transaction. And it was a very ponderous, uh, ponderous system. When we moved in the 1990s to making the, um, all these exchanges to make them came simply electronic, the process of avoiding a, uh, a transaction became instantaneous. And it was much more easy for to just to launch something and to ask it to be un annulled and it, it would be avoided and the, the transaction would never have uh, take, taken place. Um, in the situation where we are, are now, um, depending what you're talking about American markets or, or European markets, but something in the region of 40% to, let's say, 60 or 70% is uh, the transaction now just made by computers, out, out, uh, by what is called algos. Al an algo is just a term that's used for a shortening of a, an algorithm. And um, these are programs uh, that decide to sell and to, and to buy. And to some extent, I was lucky that I was part of the first generation of people who were, who were doing that. So um, I'm often asked to explain how it works in detail, because I, 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 I was one of the programmers in these very, very early, early days. But what happens now is that you can typically have 2,000 uh, 2, operations within one second. It goes extremely, extremely fast. What what is uh, happening? To, as as, as I mentioned about uh, you know voiding a particular um, a, a particular transaction was a very ponderous and complicated process. You had people to walk or even run uh, within the uh, trading room. Uh, it was not easy to do, and people would really hesitate before doing that. Now, typically, typically um, there's a not a lot of voiding of the operations. Uh, in in one incident, which was a, a crash that happened, it was on the. Uh, um, 6th of May 2010, which is called a flash crash because it happened, because you can make 2,000 operations within two seconds. A crash may happen within a, within a very short period of, of, of time. And uh, that crash developed actually over a period of, of 14, uh, 14 uh, seconds. There were something like uh, 28,000, as far as I remember, operations during these 14 seconds. But these operations, most of them were voided. Only 200 contracts actually were actually exchanged. All the rest, uh, which is like 99%, were, were voided. Why, why, is, why is there such a, a, a large amount now of, uh, of operations being, being, uh, being canceled? Uh, some people call that um, quote stuffing. You're stuffing, you know, it's just pushing thing in, inside. But quote stuffing, I think, is, is not a, a term that explains very much why people would do that. Some people say, well, it's just to encumber the markets, but there's no benefit to encumbering the markets. What is actually done by all these operations which are avoided and not is essentially to find out what is the offer and what is the, um, and, and what is the um, demand supply, what is the supply and what is the demand on, on, on the market. Typically, when, in the old times, when you were around that uh, uh, the pit, it was called the pit, when you run the, the, the pit, uh, you had people who say, well, I'm prepared to buy for this price and, 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 and sell for that price. And typically, the people would tell something, would, people, would be people who would be uh, uh, prepared to buy or to sell very close to the last price which had been obtained. Uh, let's say 
uh, a share of uh, BP uh, went for 2050, the people would say, I'm prepared to buy and, and to sell. And they wouldn't say, I'm prepared to buy at 30, or I'm, I'm prepared, uh, no. They would make offers very close to the last price because that's the one that's the reference. So somebody would say, well, I'm prepared to sell at 2060. And another one would say, well, I'm prepared to buy at 2040, very close to the 2050, which was the last price. What would, they tell you, what would that tell you about anybody was prepared to sell at 30 or to buy at 10? Nothing at all. You wouldn't know at, that at all. But if you want to have a pure, uh, uh, I would say, a full understanding of the market at a particular time, you would like to know also if there anybody is prepared to buy at 10 and, or, uh, and if anybody is prepared to, um, to sell at 30, because you may try to move the, the, the market in that particular direction. So the reason why so many of these operations are annulled and never develop into a real transaction of sale is essentially because people are trying to map the market as a whole. They go there and say, is anybody prepared to sell, at, at, uh, to buy at 10? And if somebody says, yes, yes, me, they say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't want to, uh, I made a mistake, I don't want to do But then they, they know it. They know there's somebody there prepared to do that. And that makes it possible, for, of course, for an algo, for a, um, a robot on the market to have a much better view. It's like a 3D view of, what, of how the market actually is. Now, what happened in, in, uh, in 2010, after that flash crash, is the SEC, Securities and Exchange um, Committee in the United States, which is a regulator for these um, 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 stock exchange, they made an investigation. And they had to go into these 20, 28,000 operations over, over 30 seconds, for instance. The issue there, as you realize, is that most of the time, the regulator don't have the means, actually, to do anything of the, of, of the time. They don't have the, the resources to, to do that. Uh, there were statements being made by Monsieur Jouillet in France, who is the head of the uh, French regulator, to say, well, we, we can mobilize all the resources we have to investigate something like that. And then for three months, we're just working on that. It is clear that by uh, doing things of that type, the industry makes it nearly impossible uh, to see exactly what, what's going on. The reason, in my view, why there wasn't m too much of an effort uh, to change this, why is the regulator actually, uh, uh, what I say, uh, tolerating anything like that? And that has changed, and uh, the Bundesbank uh, recently has, uh, has uh, moved in in order to, pri to prohibit some of these practices. But my feeling is that in the, uh, in the period in the period um, to, after 2008, there was, again, uh, would I say, a common interest to have the stock exchange values, the course, to go up. Everybody was interested in doing that. And the reason was, was essentially from the American side, the, the following. Um, at the beginning of the crisis, let's say 2006, um, the resources of, of families in terms of uh, what they call the uh, the egg nest, which is the uh, the, 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 the the savings company, uh, uh, households have, have been make, making uh, sixty in the 2006. About 60 percent of the savings of families were put in the value of their of their house. 40 percent were uh, in terms of bonds or uh, or shares or, or stocks in the um, on the stock exchange or in uh, uh, that that instruments. When the market, when the uh, subprime crisis that takes place, it is about 60% of the reserves of the, um, of the uh, households, which is lost in, in that way. What can we do? Well, one thing that everybody agrees can be done is lifting the uh, stock market. Uh, that would reconstitute to some extent the, uh, um, the, um, the savings of, 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 of families, because the other part has been totally depleted by the, uh, by the crisis. A lot of people, 30% or 35% currently in the United States, um, of people who have a loan on their house are underwater, meaning that they owe to the, to the, uh, to the, um, the lender more money than they would get by selling, selling the house. And there was, I mean, you know, there was some suspicion that there was some, uh, how would I say, effort made to lift the uh, stock market. And uh, when everybody was saying, well, this is a bit paranoia, maybe it's not the way, and, and so on, at that point, a, um, the head of a um, regional um, 
a regional uh, federal bank in the United States said uh, in a statement, he said, well, would it be so bad if, it were told, if we were told that the government has uh, operated in, uh, you know, in the back scenes to do something like that, uh, which was regard, like, uh, regarded as a kind of a, a vowel that pro it was probably done. To some extent, if, if that was done, I mean, it was very, I would I say, uh, high frequency trading was probably the, 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 the way to, to do that. Um, not in my last book, but the, the book before, I show some uh, uh, diagrams that were, have been produced by a company called Nanex. And that company Nanex, they specialize in collecting all these data about operations, even the very fast one. And uh, I, I should have thought, next time I'll bring you a, a picture of that. Uh, if you want to push the markets in a particular way, you can do it. But you, if you do it as a human being, you will, you know, you will see some operations going like this. But when you you do like um, you try to lift the market in a particular direction by doing simply um, two thousand operations in bursts of one second, you cannot do it in a way that the market would react. You would, would be there pushing in one particular direction. So your strategies would show in a very very clear geometrical uh, pattern. And there are some beautiful figures like that showing some different strategies that were, using, uh, were being used by people, hoping, I guess, that nobody like Nanex would be there just to catch that with their, with their cameras to see how that, how that happens. I mentioned last time what's called revolving doors, uh, people, who, um, people who work for a regulator change the rules in some way and then join the company that's uh, benefiting essentially from the fact that uh, the, the rule has been changed. I mentioned um, Robert Rubin, um, the Secretary of the Treasury in the United States. The company Citigroup wants to buy the uh, um, Travelers uh, Insurance Company. They're not allowed to do that because of the Glass-Steagall Act, which restricts the activity in which one particular um, as a financial establishment can, uh, uh, can, can work. The rule is being modified by Mr. Rubin and by Mr. Um, I forget his name. You know his name. Huh? Summers. Summers, by Mr. Summers. And uh, a few months later, Mr. Rubin joins uh, Citigroup, uh, and he ends up being, being the, the CEO. Unfortunately for him, he becomes CEO at the beginning of the crisis, and he works there as CEO only like something like three or, or, or six months. Another case is, is, is Madam um, Wendy Graham, who deregulates, deregulates the uh, energy uh, sector in, uh, in the United States just before taking a, um, a job on the board of the uh, Enron company, which would be a major company uh, benefiting for, from that. This particular uh, thing, I will not go into details because I know that some of the, uh, the people who have joined us for the, the panel would, would like to speak specifically about that phenomenon that we called regulator capture, the capture by an industry of the re regulator. Um, I will probably uh, stop on that particular note, but I'd like to rem um, to uh, usually, I mean, what is said about that danger of, um, of, of the regulator being captured by the industry, it is essentially uh, due to the fact that the uh, salaries which um, are being uh, dispensed in these two different sectors, in being the regulator or being in the industry, are usually not of the same, the same amount, and it is tempting, therefore, to um, how would I say, wanting to end your career by making a m bit more money by joining an industry that you know very well because you've been uh, working in, in that respect. Um, can that be solved? Yes, it could so be solved by, by um, um, raising the salaries of the people who are part of the regulator, and which are therefore part of the public sector, but that why would they be paid more than, than uh, other, other civil servants? Uh, it would, I mean, it would simply create a terrible inflation within the uh, uh, public sector. It, this cannot be really envisaged. Um, Governor Kuhn, who was with us uh, the other day, um, suggested the other approach to cap, to cap the compensation which is being given uh, within the uh, financial industry. That would be in the other approach. So it will be less tempting for the regulator to get captured by the industry at, um, at, at some point. But I, I understand from what I hear there at the first, um, first uh, row that we will be talking about that in the coming, coming minutes. So 
let's have a brief uh, inter interruption and uh, we start the, um, we'll start the, the panel, which promises to be very exciting uh, in the coming minutes. Thank you.